Well, this is Paul Byrell, and it's been a while since I've set my camera up. I'm not even sure if I have it set up correctly. Um, we've been to Yellowstone and back. I've been into the hospital and back, and um, it's, been a, it's been a challenging summer, but it's been a good one as well. One of the topics that I've been asked quite often has to do with assigning an herb, an astrological correspondence. Um, and that would be, I would have to say, herbs which are not part of the traditional library um, that we have of herbs and the correspondences. We have some dating back to Gerard. We have Culpepper is probably our very traditional source. There are a few newer authors. Um, there are some contemporary authors. Um, and, and, and the contemporary ones, we all seem to have our own preferences. So I wanted to talk about how I go about it. Um, first, I have been a professional astrologer for over 40 years. So my knowledge of astrology is really quite sound and based upon many thousands of clients. I deal with, even today, an average of between 40 and 50 clients each month. So my skills are kept, um, they're kept lively and, and active and busy. As an herbalist, it's been 45 years, I believe, that I've been passionately studying herbs and working with them. To, uh, to assign an herb, I'm holding lavender in my hand. Lavender was already one that we've known for some time. It's considered Mercury and Virgo. So let's say that I have an herb that I, I have no astrological correspondence for. Um, the first thing I do is I look in Culpepper to see if he knows that herb. Um, Increasingly, he did not know the herb because our herbal world today is so global compared to what it would have been three or four hundred years ago. If it's an herb that I can grow and see as a living plant, then I have a real advantage. And I'm going to talk about those first. The shamanic approach to understanding another living entity is that you must know its secret name. Uh, that goes back uh, much of that lore to what was written in the Carlos Castaneda books, um, which were part of my heritage as someone who's now in his mid-70s. The secret name of course, sounds quite magnificent and almost like Hollywood to know the secret name of something. It took me many years, and I can say truthfully that I know the secret name for almost everything. That's a big statement, isn't it? Well, the secret name it's the same one that I use. <clears throat> I learned this from also conducting past life regressions for quite a few years. And people always wanted to know what their name was um, in an earlier past life. They wanted to know what the name was, where they lived, all sorts of information so they could look it up um, in libraries and find out more about that person. And it was never that simple. I shouldn't say never, but almost never that simple. Um, for one thing, people who lived a century or two earlier probably were not educated in being able to read and write. Certainly they did not write their name all the time. 
and they did not sign checks or credit card slips or carry cards around with their names on. Um, they were much more casual with their name than they are today. And they didn't travel. They did not travel from place to place like we do today. And I found that most often when you ask someone what their name was, what they call themselves, they would say me. Well, I'm just me. And it seems so simple. And yet, that really is the secret name for almost everything. I worked with my cat, Eleanor. She's passed away. Um, she was my familiar. And I learned from times that we would spend dreaming in each other's space that her name for herself was me, although in her language um, I can't say it or reproduce it. I could hear it though. Um, I sometimes understood it when she spoke to me. Me. Everything, I believe. Every plant, every creature, I think that they have that same secret name. Me. Because it's what you call yourself, in whatever language it might be. So, Lavender would say, I am me, but not in American English, but in Lavender. So how do we bridge that gap? I spent years um, with summer programs that would run two and three months in the gardens that we had in the Seattle area, in Redmond. And I would teach people how to become me for a plant. So one of the first steps, and there's no particular order, one of the steps is to understand the plant botanically. How does it grow? How does it partake of the sun? Does it adjust its leaves? Does it want a lot of sun? Does it share the sun? Um, do the leaves fall down when the sun is too intense? Um, all, all sorts of questions like that. How does it interact with the sun? How does it interact with rain and water? Does it pull the water toward the center where the roots are? Um, are the roots spread out and shallow so they can get water just as it seeps through the, the grass? How does it reproduce? Does it produce flowers and use scent and color to attract just the right pollinator? Does it pollinate with the wind? Does it self-pollinate? How does it go about reproducing? That's a very important step because sometimes the reproductive life of a plant is a very different personality than the medicinal plant that we use. Sometimes they're very aggressive when it comes to reproduction and they produce a plant which is just lovely and peaceful. Sometimes it's more consistent. So all of that botanical information, some of which we can learn from printed data, records, information that's been gathered by educators and um, horticultural people and botanical people and catalog writers. And, and we can study that. That's one component. What history does the plant have? That, to me, is a very interesting part, part of what I've specialized in. What stories have people written about the plant to describe its energy? What myths have grown up around the plant? What beliefs, what um, religious practices, what types of folk magic, all of those are key to its personality, 
to its quirkiness because plants are no more consistent than you are in many respects. Um, they can vary quite a bit. They will vary with the climate, with the weather. They will vary from day to day depending on the sunlight or the rain. When you think you know everything there is to know about the plant, then the next step is through meditation and taking yourself astrally or spiritually and moving yourself into the same space as the plant, leaving your body sitting at the side of the bed and becoming literally one with the plant. All that information is then brought back. Notes are written um, and it's digested and studied and that will take us then to the next step and I will save that for the next video. Thank you.